Some people are saying theft in California is legal now. What we've done is we've convinced a large number of people here in the state that there is no consequence for their action. And so we have this increased lawlessness that comes from it. The view is I can take other people's property because nothing will happen to me. So what happens if somebody steals at the store? Most retailers uh, have learned that if they call law enforcement for a theft of less than $950, that either law enforcement will not respond, or if they respond, at most what they will do is issue a citation. My guest today is Vern Pearson, District Attorney of El Dorado County in Northern California. He also served several years with California's Department of Justice as Deputy Attorney General. You have to hold people accountable for their actions. That is the practical reality. And if you tell people you're not going to hold them accountable for their actions, there's a consequence for that. And the consequence is increased crime. Why is theft and robbery out of control in California? And why are the statistics not reflecting this rise in crime? We'll find out in today's episode. I'm Siamak Korami. Welcome to California Insider. Well, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. We want to talk to you about theft. Some people are saying theft in California is legal now. Is this true? Well, it, technically not legal, but not enforced is probably the better way to put it. It's certainly if it's less than $950. So uh, with the passage of Prop 47 about eight years ago, what we did was we, we looked at most property crimes and uh, that were being prosecuted at that time and said uh, many of them that were felonies are now misdemeanors and many that were felon uh, misdemeanors are essentially nothing and there's a lack of enforcement for them. So what happens if somebody steals at the store or if somebody steals? Yeah, well, and one of the, the, the core areas to understand here is that there's this um, uh, used to be what was called petty theft with a prior. In other words, if someone steals and they have any amount of property on them when they're, they're caught by law enforcement, uh, if they have a history of that same type of theft, they could be charged with a felony, hence petty theft with a prior. Uh, and nowadays what happens, in, and we've seen it with some of these swarm uh, uh, smash and grab robberies in stores where the 15 people are running out with, with stolen property uh, nine are detained, let's say. Uh, two of them have a large quantity amount of money uh, uh, of theft that's been stolen, property that's been stolen. And the other seven have uh, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars worth of property. They're only going to be charged with a misdemeanor depending on the circumstances. And in California, the way it works is that essentially misdemeanors have very little consequence, certainly as it relates to property crime. So can you explain very little consequence what it means? Well, it, it, the practical reality is, is that most retailers uh, have learned that if they call law enforcement for a theft of less than $950, that either law enforcement will not respond, or if they respond, at most what they will do is issue a citation uh, to the person who is stealing that property. So the practical reality is most re retailers in, in California has some type of policy telling, them, telling the employees not to report low-level property crimes. And, and that's for a number of understandable reasons. One is there's no consequence for if, if they do report it. And number two, if the person is uh, emotionally disturbed in some way, fights with their employees, uh, injures an employee, uh, something like that happens, then uh, uh, oftentimes what will happen is that the, the store or, uh, will be sued by the person that they attempted to arrest. So from a, a liability standpoint, oftentimes uh, uh, retailers are just So the thief can actually go and sue the store yes, yes. and the stores are afraid of that lawsuit. Right, right. We're a very litigious society here in California and the stores are, and their insurance carriers really are afraid with being sued for uh, uh, trying to stop a crime that has little or no consequence. You mentioned when somebody has a misdemeanor, they would get a ticket. Right. Uh, what does that mean? Would they end up having to pay a fine? Would they, have to, would they end up going to prison or would they? 
The practical reality is over the last several years, they would get a citation citing them into court and they probably would never show up to court and there probably would never be any consequence for the most part. And depending on what city you're talking about, San Francisco, Los Angeles, there's little or no consequence for, for theft. And so what we've done is we've convinced a large number of people here in the state that um, there is no consequence for their action. And so we have this increased lawlessness that comes from it. The view is I can take other people's property because nothing will happen to me. Um, and if, if you do that enough times, and we've seen it, there's been a number of different studies that has been done that said we have the same people that are stealing over and over again, uh, and when they're caught, there's no consequence. And what is the impact of this? Is this going to affect us in any bigger ways? W when we watch, when we turn on the news, or we watch, turn on YouTube, and you see these smash and grabs taking place, or large scale thefts, and then you have uh, Walgreens, let's say, closing their stores, or Starbucks more recently saying, we're going to close stores in certain areas because we can't uh, deal with the, the crime that's associated with it. Um, and it's, it, I think it's a, uh, uh, it, it's something that increases over time in terms of where society at large is saying there's no consequence for, for criminality then uh, we're kind of losing a big part of society itself. And so people uh, don't feel comfortable walking the streets of San Francisco. You have large um, uh, associations that say, we don't want to have our conference in San Francisco or in Los Angeles because um, we don't want to have our, our people being robbed or, or other otherwise harmed. Um, in that manner. Now, do you think this could spill into other types of crimes, or is it going to stay with what it is? No, I think it, it is. I mean, w when we as a society say that uh, low-level crimes have little or no consequence, I think the effect of that is that more serious crimes uh, increase as well. And I think that's what's happened over the last several years. Uh, some people and some newspapers are actually looking at the data and they're saying that crime is not up. Right. Despite all the videos that we see on social media and yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's wrong. The, the data is, is uh, uh, incorrect at this point. And let me explain what I mean. When, we, when, we, when Prop 47 decriminalized uh, certain types of drug crimes and low level property crimes, it changed the way we report crimes. In other words, uh, if it, it was a misdemeanor before, it became essentially nothing. Many felonies became misdemeanors. So uh, when, when people say they feel in their communities as though their neighbors' or houses are being burglarized, uh, they see videos of Walgreens having as many as 20 different shopliftings in a, in a day, and then they ask the question, where's the reports of this? When, when we look at the numbers, why isn't the data following that? And this, what this goes back to is this, this problem with retailers not fully reporting the crimes. In other words, um, if there's a disincentive to report for a retailer, in other words, you might, if you call law enforcement, number one, they not, might not respond. Number two, if they do respond, they'll only issue a citation at most and there'll be no consequence. So retailers have kind of shifted the way they deal with that. The, the more accurate numbers I I within the data of where crime is are uh, things around uh, shootings, because those are reported to law enforcement, uh, uh, crimes involving automobiles. In other words, a car burglary, uh, a car theft. Insurance companies here in California and throughout the United States require people to, to have a police report. Even if it's a simply a police report where you call in and you take, have a police report taken by, by phone call or you go online and taking it, there's an accurate record of that. And what we've seen in the last uh, six or seven years is those types of crimes have gone up dramatically. Uh, auto burglaries, Auto thefts are up dramatically, and that's a truer uh, uh, set of data for where crime actually is in California. What about the shootings? What's the difference between shootings and homicides? Because the homicide yeah. numbers are very up. The homicide and numbers are up, but and the we've been told by experts to only trust the homicide homicide numbers because. 
You, well, and that's true because there's an accurate reporting for homicides, but it's also not true. In other words, the, the shootings are up even more than the homicides are up. And uh, what's happened post 9-11 is most trauma centers throughout the United States, and particularly here in California, are staffed with doctors and, and nurses who have uh, developed a high de degree of expertise in dealing with gunshot wounds. A lot of them are veterans or have served either in the military or supported that. And the, the various techniques for treating gunshot wounds means that your survivability today is significantly higher than it was back in the, the peak of crime in the 1990s. So we've gotten better at dealing with shootings Right, um, but we have a lot more shootings, so right. we have less homicides. Right, is that is that? Yeah, we have a proliferation of guns. Uh, we have, there's a lot of firearms here in, in the United States and here in California, and because of various policies that have gone into uh, effect, uh, more people are carrying firearms when they're committing crimes, uh, and then ultimately there's more shootings. But the treatment for for people who have been shot. The, the, the likelihood of surviving is tremendously higher today than it was back in the 1990s. Now, what about the policymakers? So uh, you have been involved with the district attorneys. You, you've led the organization. What, what are the policymakers thinking when they're seeing all of this? Well, I, I, I think they're, the legislature here in California is uh, largely disconnected from the people they represent. And I just don't know there's any other way of, of describing it. I'll give you a for instance. Um, recently, uh, over the last few years, there was a effort to go to what's called zero dollar bail. In other words, bail where the person is not required to, to they can be released without putting up any money. They mentioned bail was racist, right? Because it's yeah, affecting there are all sorts of arguments and, uh, about if you're yeah. poor, you can't afford. Right, and and so there was a there was a bill that passed, and then there was a referendum where the people of the state of California rejected that uh, referendum. Uh, uh, rejected that law. So it's not on the books today. And there's an effort going on again in the California legislature to come back to it. So in other words, that's what I mean by disconnect in terms of the voters spoke very clearly, we don't agree with letting people out of custody who have committed crimes uh, without some type of consequence or some type of, of uh, a string tied to them to ensure that they come to court and that they don't commit other crimes. The voters rejected that type of zero dollar bail, and yet the legislators are seeking to do it once again. And what about the rest of the uh, California government? So you guys, the district attorneys, and then there is the police, and then there is other factors. How much say do you guys have, or how much can you guys do, or have you been doing? In well, the district attorney in any given county has a lot of influence over how crimes are prosecuted. Uh, and from county to county, there's a huge uh, variety. In other words, or, or, or huge differences, probably the better way to put it. In Los Angeles County, you have George Gascone, who, when he came into office, he made certain policy decisions that uh, zero bail, letting people out of custody, not, not using three strikes, not differentiating on offenders uh, that had significant criminal history versus ones that have uh, little or no criminal history, not prosecuting people for, for using firearms in the commission of a, of a crime. And, and then you, you compare that to certain other jurisdictions and the district attorneys uh, are, are very aggressive with dealing with crime. And the differences are pretty stark in terms of you know, counties like my county, uh, Placer County, have the lowest um, per capita crime uh, in California and among the lowest in, in uh, the United States. And law enforcement has a very good relationship with the communities versus in other jurisdictions where law enforcement do, does not have a very good relationship. The DAs do not have a good relationship with the community and crime is very high. So do you think certain counties in California, based on the district attorneys that they have, they're gonna be very different from rest of California. Yes. You know, you're going to have a complete different experience living in LA versus you live in San Diego or you live in Orange County. Is that how it's going to be in the near future? Well, it really shouldn't be that way that there's a, a different quality of life from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But we, we, you know, the practical reality is that you have certain communities where there's been a uh, philosophical shift, there was a political shift. 
um, to, to uh, what I can characterize as a culture of lawlessness. And we're, we're the, the DA behaves more of a public defender and is sympathetic to defendants uh, as opposed to sympathetic to the victims of crime. And uh, th that's a kind of at its core what the differences are. In my view, the way I was trained and in my experience in from my career as a prosecutor for 30 years is that you know, we look for first and foremost to take care of the victims of crime uh, and y we can acknowledge and recognize that, that sometimes people uh, get involved in cri criminal activity for whatever reason might be. Um, and I'm certainly not an advocate for what's been characterized as mass incarceration. But you have to hold people accountable for their actions. That is the practical reality. And if you tell people you're not going to hold them accountable for their actions, there's a consequence for that. And the consequence is increased crime. Now, do you think criminals are actually looking at different districts and saying, okay, I, in here yeah. I can do, if I'm in San Francisco, it's okay for me to break into a car and take the backpack versus I shouldn't do that in some other. Yeah, and, and that's an excellent point. So with, with uh, uh, car burglaries, car thefts, uh, the city of San Francisco versus uh, San Mateo County where the, the, the uh, SFO, the airport in San Francisco is actually located in San Mateo County which is right next door. That the, the policies between those two uh, uh, jurisdictions are night and day. In San Mateo County, if you steal things, if you break into cars, if you steal a car, you will be held accountable for that. In San Francisco, you will not. The car break-ins, car thefts are dramatically higher in San Francisco than they are right next door in San, Fran in San Mateo County. And what we've seen is that the, the criminals do communicate with each other. There's videos, we have a video out of uh, Folsom Prison of a, a uh, uh, a murderer from L.A. County uh, right after the George Gascon directives came out in, into effect and they're, they're toasting drinking, it's called Pruno, uh, inmate manufactured uh, alcohol, and they're toasting the Gascon directives and how that will change them. So we, I, I think we've seen it, I've seen it in my career, uh, the criminals know uh, how laws have shifted. When three strikes took place, going back many years, uh, a, a crime uh, rapidly was, was decreasing after the passage of three strikes. When inmates would come into custody, they were all talking about whether or not someone was a, was a striker or not a striker. There was a real uh, a communication amongst uh, uh, criminals uh, regarding what the consequences would be. And there was a, an awareness that they had that they would be held accountable for their actions. It seems like some counties are more easier for criminals to go to to commit the crime and then maybe people go to these counties, commit the crime and come out. Is this happening? I, well, I think it's definitely happening. In, in depending on jurisdiction, uh, jurisdictions have reputations for uh, whether or not people are held it, uh, in custody or not held in custody. And going back to the example I used before with San Francisco and San Mateo County right next door. Um, in San Francisco, uh, it's pretty well known that uh, most people will either not be booked in, f who are arrested, will either not be booked into jail or if they're booked into the jail, they'll be released pretty quickly. Right next door in San, San Mateo County, that's very different. And there's a, there's a recent example where a, a, a person on BART traveling from San Francisco down to the airport was uh, assaulted and robbed on the uh, uh, on the on the tram, uh, the BART tram, and the uh, in technically in San Francisco, uh, he the individual was arrested, taken to the San Francisco jail. It was a Sunday, and the jail basically told law enforcement, "We're not going to take this individual because it's a Sunday and we're not doing intake today." So wow. law enforcement drove down to San Mateo County, booked the person in San Mateo County uh, Jail, and because it's public transit, San Mateo County actually prosecuted that individual. Um, and we know it, people that work within the system, we know where these variances are, and it, 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 we're silly to think that uh, uh, criminals don't also, aren't also aware of the same differences. You mentioned Gascon, and where do you think these uh, policies come from? Because they've been pretty controversial. A lot of people have 
yeah. have, have said that these are not good for the criminal justice system. Well, I, I think in some respects it's just a, a well-intentioned but misguided uh, effort uh, uh, to change the system. And I, I, my own personal opinion is that he, although he has a lot of experience in the criminal justice system, he just doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand that when you change something on one end of it, as, as in you put out a directive saying there will be no firearm enhancements, um, he doesn't, seems to not understand that if you say something like that, people who before were going to do a, a what's called a strong arm robbery, uh, they wouldn't carry a firearm because they knew there was a significant consequence for that. They would feel free, well, I guess I will carry a firearm. If nothing's going to happen to me, if there's no real consequence uh, for being armed with a firearm, then that's what I'll do. And in, in California, we had uh, uh, something called 1020 Life, which was basically that you would, if you carried a firearm during the commission of a felony, if you discharged a firearm in the commission of a felony, or you, or you uh, killed someone with a firearm, there would be a significant increase in uh, penalty for that, the existence of that firearm. So it's this odd thing to where California uh, professes at a policy level uh, to be uh, uh, anti-gun, and yet we have in a large part. Yes, to go yes, it's it's it, it completely when inconsistent. When you use a gun to do a robbery, then it's okay. Right, right. N uh, now, is this fixable based on what you see? I hope it's fixable. I I hope uh, as the public uh, uh, sees what's actually happening f for themselves, and despite some of the 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 newspaper articles, some of the uh, being told by politicians that. Uh, don't believe your lying eyes, in other words, that I think the public is waking up to it and saying, you know what, this is really a problem. When, when, when you cannot walk the streets of San Francisco, when, when people are telling, uh, moving out of San Francisco be, or, or LA even, uh, because they're saying, I don't want my kids to get off the bus and have to step over homeless people that have a needle stuck in their arm. Um, I think there will be a consequence and there will be a tipping point that happens when the public will begin more aggressively to push back against these misguided policies. And how should the public get involved? Would they have to talk to their district attorneys or is it something they have to go to the, how can they make this change or what do they need to do? Do they need to pay more attention to this role? I think they, they need to pay, mo pay more attention to it and really ask you know, tough questions in terms of what are their policies when, when someone is running for elected office, whatever the office may be. Uh, to ask them tough questions about what are their plans, what's their, what's their solution for dealing with, uh, let's say, homelessness, what's their solution for dealing with crime? Do they believe in personal accountability and responsibility um, in the way that they manage their office? I was interviewing a district attorney and he told me that uh, in his county, if you actually steal a car and you, actually get, in you get arrested, you get in trouble, they give you two years, and then you go to jail and you get out in two weeks right? because they're overcrowded. Can you explain this, how, how it works? Like, is that? Well, uh, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation has, uh, as because of things like Prop 57, because of Prop 47, Prop 57, and some other changes in the rules, um, regardless of the amount of time someone is being sentenced, uh, they will make a determination on whether or not that person should be released. I'll give you a, a, a very good recent example. Um, in our county, there was a person who was caught about five years ago. He had, uh, uh, he, he conducted numerous residential burglaries. We broke into houses. He was convicted of, of 28 residential burglaries. Wow. So breaking into, uh, because of the magnitude of them, that many residential burglaries, the judge essentially sentenced him to 40 years in prison. Uh, very lengthy sentence for a lot of crime. And he had a prior history of committing those types of crimes. Uh, in a little more than four years, uh, before, after a little more than four years of a 40 year sentence, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation released him out of custody. So that's what's happening. So uh, you, you right now in the state of California, well, let me back up. 10 years ago, we had 165,000 inmates in in Department of Corrections, in prison, felons who are serving time in prison. Today we have 
uh, right around 90,000. So we've dropped dramatically the number of people that are in custody. And a significant percentage of, the, of that 90,000 are people doing uh, a long, long sentences for things like uh, multiple aggravated sexual assaults, uh, murders, people doing life without the possibility of parole. So the Department of Corrections can't release them. It's as though they're falling over themselves to release people uh, uh, early. Um, the big, the, what was characterized initially as a mass shooting in Sacramento a few months ago, the primary participants in that what turned out to be a, a gang gunfight as opposed to a mass shooting uh, were people who had been released early from, uh, from their sentences. And so it's a very big problem here in California. Why is that they're releasing these inmates? Is, is, that, is uh, that because there's no space? Because there was a court ruling back in the day that, yeah. that said that we are jamming people into these prisons. Right. Or is there other reasons? Well, we went from, as I said, 165,000. The, the capacity, what the prisons were supposed to be because of that was somewhere around 135,000. So, but we didn't stop releasing them when we hit 135. Now we're down to 90,000 and we're continuing to release people early. Um, and it, it's as though this administration and the California legislature, um, they just don't want to hold people accountable. They won't, they, it started out saving money, but then now it's gone to a point where we're just releasing people. Um, if there's a way to release someone from custody, they're releasing them. So it's more ideological. I believe so. Being in your position, you're seeing all that's happening with the district attorneys in San Francisco, LA, and crime is going up. How do you feel about it? Well, I'm bothered by it. I mean, I, I love, you know, to go to San Francisco or Los Angeles. It's not where I live, but I love to, to visit them. And I, I, uh, uh, I grew up a big chunk of the time in LA County as a child. Um, and the, to see uh, the, the, the countless homelessness that goes on, the, the crime both in San Francisco and LA and throughout the state of California, it's very disturbing and, and uh, I'd like to see some change there. Do you have any other thoughts for our audience? No, I, I greatly appreciate being uh, here and talking to you about this and I, I, uh, I hope that the public really does, you know, continue to increasingly wake up to uh, the problems that are here and how, m you know, well-intentioned but misguided policies have created a lot of the problems we're dealing with. Vern Pearson, the District Attorney of El Dorado County, was great to have you on California Insider. Well, thank you. Appreciate being here. Thank you for watching. Please click the icon on the left to subscribe to our channel. We bring you the most pressing issues California is facing with straightforward and in-depth interviews. See you in the next video.